Welcome to Free Kiwis. Uh, today we welcome uh, Professor Elizabeth Rata, who is the first Free Kiwis guest to come back for a repeat session. And we're going to talk about a talk that she gave back in May to the Hobson Rebus Club. Now, the title of the talk is History and Treatyism. Now, looking through the uh, the notes from the talk, it occurred to me that an overarching theme uh, is liberalism versus a more parochial view of uh, both governance in terms of whether or not we live in a democracy and uh, disciplinary thinking in the school curriculum. So, Elizabeth, is that a good way to think about this, uh, the issues that you're talking here? about here. Yes. yes, that's absolutely accurate, Michael. Um, it's liberalism on one hand, and uh, um, the conditions of liberalism enable democracy, and on the other hand, various forms of communitarianism, or group ways of organising um, societies. Um, where the authority goes to the group and more specifically to the elite in a group. Um, and uh, what's happening in New Zealand with um, whether you use the word treatyism or tribalism or um, co-governance is all part of this um, attack on liberalism via a whole communitarian mindset. And what I talked about um, last month was to do with the mindset required to under, undermine um, the way of thinking required for liberal, liberal democracy. Yeah. So let's elaborate on that a bit. I, I mean, one of the other things that seems to come up is the evolutionary psychology perspective and in particular David Geary's distinction between biologically primary knowledge and secondary knowledge and it, it seems to me that that connects quite strongly both to the idea of democracy and the idea of disciplinary thinking because both of those are products of secondary thinking whereas a more socio-cultural view both of education and of the way in which society is run is potentially founded more in a, in a biologically primary uh, way of understanding. Yes, Gary's work is really useful. And what I did in the talk was I pushed um, Gary's idea of the distinction between primary thinking and secondary thinking um, in terms of how we think about time, temporal time, Temporal perception, or yeah. to think um, the way we we regard time and seeing it as very much in two categories. Uh, one is a spontaneous time perception, which fits very well with the primary thinking, with socio-cultural approaches to how we look at the world, compared with secondary thinking and uh, um, an historical way of thinking about time. So let's unpack that a little bit. So what, what do you mean by a spontaneous way of thinking about time? Well, spontaneous time perception, according to work being done by Ari uh, Wilshard, um, really fascinating work about history and the curriculum, he identifies two main ways of um, thinking about time. He calls them time per temporal perception and primary temporal perception or spontaneous time perception has three features. One is that it's cyclic ecological, and that's all our ancestors had that way of thinking, you know, about the seasons, understanding time through the regular changing of the seasons. A second feature is social um, time perception, and that's to do with being able to think about time in terms of generations and it's usually up to four generations at the most going back to your great grandparents and once again all our ancestors thought about time in that way in terms of what we were able to remember or what our parents could remember and passed on to the children how does that connect with the uh Māori concept of whakapapa which might go back more than more than four generations very often Oh, well, that connects to the third 
feature of spontaneous time perception, which is the mythological one. And at that point, you move into the notion of history's collective memory, where how we remember um, is linked to mythologies about the past. And genealogical understandings fit into that mythological temporal perception. If you think about the um, genealogicals that go back, trace back, say, to the gods, um, in the New Zealand case, back to the canoes, um, in, um, perhaps in Greek, back to the, um, the Greek gods, all cultures have a way of trying to fit um, what we know about our own lives into the ver a very grand scale, but it's a mythological scale. It's not um, a, 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 an historical one. Yeah, um, they're the, the three features of three features of spontaneous time perception or primary thinking about time. So yeah, I've studied various Greek, ancient Greek social groups, and it's a common feature of them. I mean, especially the groups that are called uh, agenos in the singular, uh, that they um, they're religious groups, but they they trace their ancestry back usually to a, a god or a demigod. So, for example, the Heraclidae, that ending a die, it means the sons of, the descendants of. So they claim to be the, the descendants of these distant figures, as I say, either gods or demigods. So I guess the, the next question is something like. Uh, is there for you a distinction between this kind of mythological thinking and oral history? Because, of course, a lot of people nowadays would claim that oral history can actually integrate true facts about distant periods from the past. What's your view about that? Um, yes, you're right. Oral history is very much part of mythological time perception. And that's why it, in a curriculum, it belongs in literature, it belongs in say, anthropology, because all societies needed a way to um, position themselves in terms of the grand scheme of things, uh, especially in relation to the gods. And I'm thinking of the importance of myths and legends. You know, you think of for people from, um, you know, from the British Isles, the Arthurian legends played an important role. So they're not just the gods, they're the heroes, of course, and so uh, most most societies have ancestry that involves gods and heroes, and that's part of the oral tradition as well. But it's not history. It's um, it's spontaneous time perception. So it, it's interesting. I mean, there's a whole debate to be had about the value of oral history in, in history more generally. It sounds like you're taking quite a hard line here and suggesting that there's very little of substance in oral histories. Um, I think other practitioners might beg to differ, but I, I'm sort of sy sympathetic to your view because it occurs to me that even in New Zealand, there are lots of big events that didn't leave a mark in oral history. And one example is the arrival of Abel Tasman, you know, who came to Golden Bay. There was a brief exchange with the local Maori population. I think one Dutchman was killed and one Maori. And apparently there's no record of this in Maori oral history. I, I think partly because that particular iwi or tribe was later scrunched by some other iwi and they ceased to exist. But it, it, it was such a big event in Maori history. And it's not that long ago, you'd think that if oral history was, you know, quite good at um, keeping traces of the past, that would be one of the things that that, that stayed around. And, and also, it seems like there's no trace of the Moa in, in Maori oral history, even though, of course, there's a whole phase of Maori civilization, which is described as the kind of Moa hunters when they were kind of bringing the Moas down into these river valleys. And we found some we found that attested archaeologically. We can see where they've been they've been processing the Moa, basically killing them and, and cutting them up and eating them. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's a big case for, for oral history, and many people people are welcome to kind of write in and tell us. But th those two things in the New Zealand case lead me to be a bit skeptical. And I could add also cases from ancient history and from uh, Serbo-Croat oral poetry in the former Yugoslavia. They have a whole tradition of these epic songs, and they often get details right. I mean, they're obsessed about the Battle of Kosovo, uh, but uh, you know wars between the Serbs and and the and the the Ottomans, but they often get details wrong, and historians often have to say, well, this is the oral tradition, but the facts are actually uh, otherwise. Yeah. Yes, I think probably the be. I mean, the, the, there is a place for some oral history, but I would um, uh, turn point readers to listeners to uh, Professor Paul Moon's um, book. Uh, this horrid practice where he 
he talks quite a lot about if you're going to use oral history, these are the sorts of um, things you should be looking for. You know, is it uh, is what being claimed in oral history verified by from other sources? What is the source of the oral history and so on? So it's not that there is no place for oral history, but it does need to be independently verified. And Paul Moon gives um, a, a very thorough account of the processes of verification. But you're certainly right about oral history in terms of New Zealand. And in a way, it can um, have an important, any use of oral history um, for political means um, needs to be looked at very, very carefully. I'm just thinking at the moment of the business with Nati Kuri and the Kumadik, the claims for the Kumadik, um, the big ocean sanctuary around the Kumadik Islands. Now, um, Ngāti Kuri actually ceased to exist as a tribe between probably the 1820s up to about the 1870s, 1880s, and then disappeared from the consciousness of people of that time right up until the 1980s. Um, there had been wars with Te Rarua in the 1820s, which accounted for it. And, and by um, the 1970s, um, people were saying in the Māori Land Court, um, we are Opodi, you know, where they didn't, Ngāti Kuri was not referred to at all. Ten years later, once claims could claims were being made for fisheries in the area, for the white sands right up at the top of the Pāringa Ringa Harbour, then you had um, you, you had memories of Ngāti Kuri being um, brought back and people once again identifying with that tribe. So it's not that the tribe never existed, it did exist in the past, but there had been quite a long period of time when people did not identify with the tribe. And of course, um, the the um, practices and cu the customary practices of the historical tribe would not have included very you know considerable ocean voyaging as far out as the Kumadek Islands and beyond. So the claims being made at the moment, and the way Nati Kuri has actually put a halt to the. Um, the proclamation of a huge um, sanctuary, ocean sanctuary, of the north of New Zealand is um, is based on an oral history that um, needs a really thorough investigation. Some parts of it, yes, there is a bit of truth in parts, but then there, you know, there are parts that do need. Um, independent verification, given that the politics of what is being claimed based on this, you know, the, the history put forward um, are, are considerable for the entire country and not just for the country, but for the world, actually, when one thinks about the importance of, of that huge, that proposed huge ocean sanctuary. So that's one example of how we have to be very careful with oral history because it can be used for political purposes. Sure. And actually, it seems to me that what you're alluding to here is an, an important hallmark of academic disciplines in general, whether it's history or science, and, and also an important hallmark of democracy, which is the idea that um, that claims are contestable. So in democracy, of course, we set that up in the structure of a, a government and an opposition who are, who are contesting ideas and policies. In science, we set it up as a theory being tested by experimentation and also through argumentation amongst scientists. And, and in history, it's going to be claims about the past, which are contested on the basis of evidence by historians. But in a more mythological or sociocultural situation, that idea of contestability doesn't necessarily exist. It might be a more authoritarian situation or, or one in which claims are held to be sacred and therefore not, not contested. Yeah, and in a way, given the purpose that a sociocultural approach to history takes, 
you know, we can understand why um, the, the collective memory of a people isn't put to the test because it's there for different purposes. It's there to unite a group. It's there to give the group some sense of psychological um, security by linking them to the past. So, uh, you know, fair enough. It's collective yeah. memory rather than history. Well, sa <laughs> sacred stories have an important purpose in a culture, right? They're, they're not, they, they have yeah. no reason. They're, they're, they're important to us all. It's a question of what they're, they're saying to us and how they shape our, our society. Yes, if I can go back to using Nati Kuri as an example again, the um, importance um, for people who identify as Nati Kuri today is of the collective memory. It, it's extremely important. You know, here are a group of people who are recovering a sense of belonging to a histo an historical group. So how the, um, the group understands their past is, of course, extremely important for the group. But when claims are made that here is the absolute truth, this is what did happen. Um, of course, one, one aspect of Ngāti Kuri history can be independently verified, and that was going back to James's comment about Abel Tasman at the beginning of January 1843, having left the South Island, Tasman came up to the top of New Zealand, and he did see people on Three Kings Island, and his the, one of the ship's illustrators actually painted what he perceived. And at that time, um, artists didn't use perception, uh, perspective in the way we'd use it, artists do today. And so the people were painted as these enormous giants. So for at least a hundred years, there were many in Europe who thought that this New Zealand was inhabited by these huge giants. How the you, you way they'd Cook. been presented. You, you mean Cook, don't you, 18, 1843? No, 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 Cook, no, no, this was I I, I, about I, 1643. Six, 1643. 1643, yeah. yeah I think. Sorry, did I say yeah, yeah, no, 1643? Yeah. 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 yeah, January the 3rd, I think it was, or the, yeah, early January 1643. Yes, 1843 would be a bit late for Cook, in fact. Um, it certainly would be. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps we can connect all of this to the history curriculum or the histories curriculum as, as it's now called. Uh, so to what extent do you see these sociocultural ideas being represented in, in this new curriculum? Is it a, a kind of uncomfortable mix of what we might call historical disciplinary thinking and sociocultural thinking to, to your mind? I think it's mainly socio-cultural thinking, and I certainly can't bring myself to use the word histories, because to say histories, you're really talking about the collective memory of, of respective groups. Um, yes, I, I'm very concerned about bringing a socio-cultural, a spontaneous time perception approach into teaching New Zealand children history, because what you're doing is you are um, promulgating a mythological approach to understanding the past, some sort of sense of timelessness, a sense of because we believe this to be the case, therefore it was the case, rather than a scientific approach to understanding the past, which is using the, um, the historical method where you do look carefully at sources, you do independently verify what is being said, and you separate yourself from the past. Um, you, you object, it's an objective study of what the best we understand about what went on in the past. Of course, like science, um, the study of history is truth-seeking. We can never establish the absolute truth because, of course, we can't go back and be there, but we can use um, these verifiable sources. We can put what we do know to the test, as you mentioned, Michael, so that at least what we do understand to be history is up there for um, analysis, discussion, criticism, testing. Isn't it the case, though, that the, the new curriculum sort of commences in 1840? 
Yes, and it's very it's it's very parochial. It's almost as though what happened in New Zealand happened here without any context. Of course, you can't understand the history of any area if you don't place it within a wider spatial context. I, I agree, so but if it, if it starts context. in 1840, doesn't that well? Just that it, it isn't really timeless. It, it, it's starting at the the point at which the, the treaty was signed, which is an historical document. Yes. So uh, yes, it's, I'm, it's I'm, very... I'm just I'm just probing this idea a little bit that it's it, it, it's really mythological in nature. Oh, uh, right, yes. But yeah. it's very contradictory. So it takes the treaty as a as a point and then talks about the timelessness of the treaty, the idea that the treaty um, is always speaking, that the treaty has a meaning which is ongoing I rather see. than being a specific historical document. So your and view is that it's almost a set of... Uh, mythological claims about what it is to be a New Zealander. Yeah. Is that a, a way and, to think about it? Yes, it's and also to to even start by with 1840, one cannot understand why the treaty was signed by Māori chiefs unless you go back to at least the 1770s, 1780s and have a thorough knowledge of the um, tribal wars, because it was the what the main driver for signing the treaty was the establishment of law, the desire to end the appalling carnage and conflict that had gone on. And when you think about it, we're talking 40, 50 years of carnage throughout many parts of the country. So it's that, that knowing about those decades explains why the treaty was signed. But the history curriculum um, is a real mixture. It takes certain things such as the 1840 treaty and then requires it to be treated in a mythological way. So it, it is a confused and very harmful document. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me as someone who only came to this country about 10 years ago that um, there's so much talk about the Treaty of Waitangi and, and the principles that are supposedly derived from it and what these mean in a whole range of um, contexts, you know, like it, it's used to justify um, so-called positive discrimination in many cases, because that's seen as, a, as an outgrowth of the treaty principles. But if you actually look at the treaty, it's very brief. You know, there's only three articles. And I would say that compared to other documents that we might compare it to, like maybe the Declaration of the Rights of Man in the French Revolutionary context or the Declaration of Independence and in the American Revolution, it's it's quite concrete. It seems like they signed this treaty at a particular time in order to deal with a particular problem. Um, and it was a sort of pragmatic solution. It, it doesn't seem to consist of lots of sort of universalistic statements. So the Declaration of Independence think, says things like all men are created equal. Treaty of Waitangi doesn't seem to de deal so much with these universals. So it, it it seems to lend itself quite poorly to being this kind of universal text that can tell us all about social justice and, and things which we might care about in the present. Yes, it's very dangerous, you know, to take to take a treaty which was of its time and responding to the conditions of the time and then give it this timeless authority. In fact, um, in the 1980s, I think it was the Governor General, um, Dame Sylvia Cartwright, who talked about the treaty speaking to us throughout time, its timelessness. But of course, if you were doing an objective study of the treaty, you'd look at the conditions of the time while it was signed, you'd look at how it was understood in later periods, for example, the Kohi Marama Conference in 1860, then you'd have a very close look at the um, the inclusion, the idea of principles and partnership, which came in, in the 1980s. Now, the problem with giving it this timeless authority is that young people will not be taught that the treaty did not have principles, that the treaty was not a partnership, that this is these ideas of principles and partnership are from the 1980s and arise out of the conditions of the 1980s and are now um, part of the political justification for co-governance. So what we want 
um, our young people to know is that whatever happens in history is located within the political and social context of the time. Yeah. And it, I mean, it kind of brings in this notion that you visit in your talk about spiritualism underpinning the the process by which we conceptualize the treaty and and the idea almost of original sin uh, and atonement for it for for sin. And and what I mean by that is, I, I mean, I think it's it's probably there's a lot of evidence uh, that the original treaty was violated during the 19th century, that there were land confiscations and other things that really rode roughshod over some of the stipulations that are there in the treaty. And then when it was revived in the later part of the 20th century, uh, redress was made for those historical violations. But at the same time, perhaps a sense of guilt was brought into play that then has been exploited to develop a, a less defensible view of the, the treaty as a partnership and uh, uh, in latter years of, uh, of the idea of co-governance being a, a way to atone for the, the sins of the past. Yes, that um, the shift in lang the language used when the treaty is referred to from the 1980s, has this spiritual quality. Um, for example, in the Tainui um, the settlement, the word atone is used, and very much a sense of the treaty, since the 1980s, the treaty has been used as um, a document of to racialize the New Zealand population, to divide it into two political categories, those who are members of a tribe and those who are not. And I'm not, I'm very deliberately not using the word Māori and non-Māori because there are many Māori who are not tribalists and yeah. there are many non-Māori who support the idea of um, of the tribe as a political category. So I'm thinking, I use the terms tribalist and universalists, so very much communitarian and, and liberalism. But this business of turning history into something which sits outside what we as people can do, giving it a supernatural authority that speaks for all time, um, is a very non-historical way to understand the past. And so what we've got is we've got primary thinking, which is connected to spontaneous time perception, which is being promoted in the curriculum today. And on the other side, we've got what I'd call proper history, which is the scientific study of the past, using methods and procedures that mean everything that is claimed must be put to the test. And that is requires secondary thinking, um, and by that I mean being able to think in abstract, objective ways. And what we're doing when we turn his curriculum history into spontaneous uh, collective memory, we are stopping our children developing the ability to think in objective, abstract ways. The same thing is happening with science, with the inclusion of Mātauranga Māori. So what I claim will happen is that throughout the 20th century, the New Zealand population became more intelligent. The, some of the list, your listeners will know about the Flynn effect. I mean, one of the causes was nutrition, but Universal education, the ability for children to think in abstract ways, was also a main cause in the development of the population's intelligence. Now, what we are doing is we are reversing that. We are now putting the type of curriculum in place that will stop children thinking in abstract and objective ways. What we are doing is telling them to think in ways to do with belief where you don't put things to the test. So the this history curriculum is like the inclusion of Mātauranga Māori throughout the curriculum, incredibly damaging to yes. New I mean, Zealand. I'm, I'm not an historian, but I am a scientist, and, and so I, I can speak with 
more, I suppose, knowledge and and uh, disciplinary expertise on the science question. And and it seems to me there one of the big problems is that all too few teachers, let alone their students, actually know what science is. So they they think that science is knowing about the natural world, but but of course it isn't. That we we get to find out about the natural world by applying scientific method, but it's that method itself which is science, a, and it is founded on this principle of contestability that that any theory uh, is falsifiable and and must be subjected to attempts to falsify it in order to improve our understanding and and if we fail to falsify a theory then it, it gains explanatory validity uh, but the minute you bring in claims that can't be tested either because they're held to be sacred or because there's just no way to gather evidence for them or against them uh, we're not doing science at all and even if we're making claims about the natural world that that is not science because we don't have the epistemological sophistication to think about it, the, those things in a scientific way and to test those ideas in a scientific way. Yes, I, I, I certainly agree that it it is extremely difficult for teachers. And I'm working with a school at the moment, assisting them to develop their history curriculum using um, my curriculum design coherence model, which is a way to achieve um, coherence between you know the abstract ideas the children will encounter and also progression so that it's a 1 to 13 school which I'm extremely fortunate in being able to work with the school so that we can also work with progression the idea of what children at year 1 need to know about the world so that they can develop an scientific historical approach to understanding the past going right through to year 13. And of course, it's an impossible task. It's absolutely daunting. And we will only be able to touch the surface of it. But because we have this so-called nationalized national curriculum, which is not a national curriculum, it's a localized curriculum, where each school in consultation with the community is required to develop its own curriculum you have teachers, um, you have schools ranging from those who have a very sound curriculum because they use what they used to use in the past and because they have teachers who are, um, are, are very well educated in, um, in a specific subject. And then on the other hand, you have schools who don't know what to teach. And I know schools like this. Yes. They no longer have knowledge in their curriculum. They've lost it. I and mean, they one, don't know where to start. One question in my mind is what will happen when the new NCEA standards are implemented, because they will, of course, act as a de facto curriculum for years 11 to 13. What, whatever they are assessing is what schools will teach. And that will have a backwash effect, at least on years 9 and 10, because the schools will be preparing their their students for the NCA years. So that may have a, a more unifying effect, but it, it may not, not be the effect a, a, an historian would like to see. No, what we'll have is increasing inequality in New Zealand between schools that have retained a knowledge-rich curriculum and a scientific approach to knowledge and schools that have lost their way, that no longer know what to teach and um, how to even think about knowledge. And so you'll have schools like the one I'm working with. Um, the, the children who come out from that school will go on and succeed in life. They will have two ways of thinking about the world. They will have, if we think about history, they will have their collective memory they will be able to be part of their ancestral groups if they wish to and um, be involved in the collective memory of those groups. But they will also be able to think about the world in an objective way using the abstract knowledge that they've acquired from the study of history. And that's, of course, what we want for the New Zealand population. Young people able to be both within their group 
and also be able to be objective and step outside their group. And I have spoken about this as um, as being partial loyalty, that you can be loyal to your group, you can be part of your group in civil society, perhaps a religion, perhaps um, an ethnic group, but you also can turn can separate yourself from the group and be able to look at it in objective ways. So, that, And that is the only way that culture changes, by people being able to say, yes, there are things that we do that we do need to change. There are things that are valuable. We'll hold on to these, that crit critical perception. Elizabeth, um, I've just finished teaching an honors course at Vic on Western civilization. And one of the books we read with my students, it was one I think I mentioned to you before, which is Joseph Henrik's recent book, The Weir Weirdest People in the World. And the weirdest people in the title are us, basically Westerners. And uh, he actually builds up this whole theory that there are, there are psychological differences between people in Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic countries and people who live in more traditional societies. And one of the mechanisms for him is that um, he thinks that the Western church, so the Catholic and later the Protestant church in the West, it systematically broke down the ability of uh, Western societies to build up sort of clan networks. And it did so partly by vastly expanding the incest taboo. The church made it impossible for people to marry their cousins, but also various sorts of affines, so their, their in-laws. And this made it very, very difficult to maintain these big clan relationships that you see in more traditional societies. Because of that, Westerners were sort of forced to create these civil associations in which they associated with non-kin. And he thinks that all of this had um, repercussions not only for European society, but also for, for European psychology, the way that we tend to think in, in our societies. So he thinks, like you, that there, um, there tends to be more abstract thought. Um, and he does talk a little bit about time. He doesn't speak directly to the concerns that you're talking about in terms of how they how people perceive the past and history. But he does talk about um, the sort of value of time. Um, and there's an interesting uh, set of evidence that he cites that comes from the Old Bailey in London. And you can look at um, the time of day at which people were arrested. There's a pretty much random sample of what people are doing at particular times of the day. And that goes back for centuries. And it seems that as the Industrial Revolution happens, people work much harder. So the process of industrialization itself sort of changed the way Europeans thought about time. Then, of course, you get things like the rail system. And the, the result is basically that it does seem to be the case that Europeans uh, or Westerners are much more uh, retentive, anally retentive, we might say, or much more sort of careful about time. Um, now, these things, Henrik's book, I mean, I think some people would say, oh, that's kind of like a racist thing to say or white supremacist or whatever, but it sort of cuts both ways. A lot of these changes, a lot of these differences that he finds in Western psychology, they cut both ways. And so the downside of that is obviously that we're sort of more time poor, we find it very difficult just to sort of exist in the moment. We all have to kind of join the yoga groups and, and meditation groups as, you know, um, as I have actually. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it, it also is quite useful for, for things like productivity. So anyway, that's a lot to say about Henrik, but I was just wondering uh, whether you think that that sort of goes together with your theory. Well, I hope that Henrik has acknowledged all those, uh, the sources for those ideas. Um, uh, one example would be the his New Zealand historian Peter Munz, who also, and Peter Munz did acknowledge the anthropological um, tradition that these ideas come from. But the, uh, uh, the, the, the idea is that it was really the spread of the Roman Empire in the early centuries, um, um, AD that spread a combination, a very powerful combination of Greek culture, Christian ideas and Roman law. And it was that combination which spread throughout Europe, which um, was the reason for the breakdown of, um, of, uh, of the clan, the tribe as the political unit. It yeah. certainly has, has, is, is the social unit. Yeah. And one of the examples given, and Alan McFarlane, the anthropologist, picks this up as well, is in 
Anglo-Saxon England, it was possible for women to bequeath land outside the kin group. And that was quite remarkable at that time, because of course the kin group wasn't just the emotional social group, it was also the legal political. But in Anglo-Saxon um, England, the legal um, constraints of kinship were quite loose. And then, um, yeah, the, the other point I'd like to mention is about time. In fact, it was probably the town clock that was the uh, a really significant development in terms of time because the link between time and authority was very strong. The church bell controlled um, how people responded to time when you got up, when you went to church. But the town clock actually enabled people to decide um, about time for themselves and ignore perhaps the church bell. So yeah, there's lots. I I, I think that um, there are lots of forces and to and you are right that it was very much in Europe that many of these forces came together and had a powerful impact. And but at its heart, it was the breakdown of the kinship group as the political unit that was the key to so to change in respect of time it seems that there are kind of two levels to think about uh it what if you're talking about the church bell or the or the town clock that that's quite a short time span but it's it gives structure to a to a day perhaps where where the bell the the clock chimes on the hour and so on and that tells people what they should be doing at, the, at this time of day. But in terms of historical thinking, it's a much longer time span, of course. And, and there, it seems to me that it's a matter of being able to uh, oh, label time over uh, a longer period uh, and and to have some kind of reference point in terms of which year it is and, and so on, so that chronologists are able to order events on a much longer time span. Yeah, actually, I'd like to, it suddenly occurred to me that um, the, the inclusion of karakia or prayers in the Māori language are being used for exactly this purpose, right. the idea of the start and the end of something being controlled by the notion of um, a, a way of thinking that says we are gathered here together um, for the pur for for purposes that are under the authority of something um, larger than ourselves, supernatural forces. So I am very concerned with the inclusion of karakia or prayers in our secular institutions, especially in our schools. Now, it's not that the prayers. Uh, prayers themselves or that they're in the Māori language. It's a way of using, it's part of this whole shift in how how our children are going to think about the world. Yeah. So yeah. So um we've we've really failed today to do the uh, live stream properly. So sorry about that to you and everybody else. But we did I did put your some of your slides and a summary of your talk in Remuera on Twitter. And we have got a question from someone called Karsten Grimm, Karsten J. Grimm. And he's, it's quite a long question in three parts, so I'll just read it out. Maybe I'll try and paraphrase it at the end as well. So he says, does Professor Rata think that contributing to treatyism is a generalized poor literacy in New Zealand of civics, especially around New Zealand's constitutional makeup and the fact we don't have one written constitution like the US or Australia. Does this potentially feed into simplicity bias and a preference for romanticized narratives re-1840, the Treaty of Waitangi being foundational, which ignores amendments that would be more salient if the US, if like the US, we had 27 amendments? Our constitutional arrangement makes uh, linearity less visible, question mark. Do built-in amendment mechanisms, fundamentally absent in the Treaty of Waitangi, also make ongoing evolution of society a key topic of focus. An uninformed public, therefore, is left with a straw man and too noble to challenge treaty as constitution ideology. So yes, yeah, so I think basically the question is, 
we have all this focus on the Treaty of Waitangi, and we, unlike in the U.S., we don't really have this idea that yes, there's an original uh, document, but then we can also amend it, and this this thing evolves through time. And of course, the British Constitution also has a big emphasis on evolution through time, and this lends itself to this kind of mythological treatment of the Treaty of Waitangi. What do you think about that? Yeah, certainly I agree. It's a romanticized um, narrative. Um, the idea that the treaty is a truth that speaks to us today. I um, I would not like New Zealand to have a constitutional document located in history in the way the United States does. I think that using any historical document and giving it a legal constitutional purpose um, causes lots of problems for later on. Something that happened in history, say, for example, a treaty, should stay at the time it was created. The problem today is that the treaty has been revived. It should not be revived. It should be seen for what it was, an important historical event that addressed the conditions of the time. So I would separate historical documents from legal and constitutional purposes. And I would not, I don't support the idea of a written constitution for that reason. I think it's worth actually distinguishing between the two uh, examples that Carsten gave. So he was talking about the American constitution and the Australian constitution, and they are very different beasts. And I think it might speak to your uh, concern about uh, having a written constitution. so the American Constitution, I mean, it's been amended over time, but it does seem to me to have a, a semi-mythological status in terms of people referring to it to uh, understand what it means to be American. So they'll, they'll talk about, they don't actually talk about principles of, the, of of their Constitution, but they talk about various amendments as having a, almost a sacred quality. So uh the right to bear arms uh, comes up a, a fair bit, and and something I very much support as well, which is freedom of speech, is enshrined in that in that constitution. I, I mean, I think that's a good thing myself, but it, it still has that that kind of status of this is what it is to be American uh, in a in almost quasi mythological way. If we compare it with the Australian Constitution, that's a much more fu- functional document. It it doesn't lend itself to talking about what it is to be Australian. And you don't hear Australians talking much about their constitution at all. What it does is simply lay out the arrangement of the federal system and what powers the states will have and what powers the, the federal government will have. And it, and so it's much more a, a constitution in the strict sense of the word of just being a, 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 a document that captures the arrangements, the political arrangements that they're operating under. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what what I support uh, the idea that the con- a constitutional constitutional legislation is simply about the procedures for say elections and so on, which is what we've got. We've because got the electoral not, act. We don't really need that to yeah, be in a constitution, yeah. perhaps. No, that's right. I I really like the idea that democracy should be very very messy that um, there should be no higher authority such as a you know, constitution or a god or whatever to appeal to, that in fact we should get into the messy um, conflict, the agreement, the disagreement that democracy is, and we shouldn't be afraid of that, Um, and that we should make any changes that we make should be based on what conditions are like now. And then in the future, people will, generations to come, they, they shouldn't be constrained by how we understand the world. Um, each generation should be able to sort of fight it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. And democracy is peaceful battle. And if you have a constitution that really says to people, this you are under this higher authority, then you take away the um the force of that peaceful battle. Well, there's also the tendency, as with other sacred texts, to then say, well, we need this text is so holy that we need a special cast of interpreters to correctly interpret the sacred texts. And of course, in the States, that leads to you know, Supreme Court and judicial review. And um, yeah, it's not a completely ridiculous system, but it does have this tendency to sort of enthrone people from a particular social class 
who are going to interpret the law in ways that if you ask the majority of people, they might not agree with. And that to me is already a diminution of democracy. And that connects to Elizabeth's concern, I think, about the the tribal elites. And and I know, Elizabeth, you're not talking on ethnic lines there. You're talking more or less on social class lines. And it does seem that whether it's Māori or non-Māori doing this, there there are there is an echelon of our society that comprises politicians, academics, uh, public servants, senior public servants who are trying to establish themselves as a kind of priesthood who will interpret these sacred messages from the past spoken to us from the, the treaty in 1840 and how we should interpret that now and what responsibilities it puts on us. It's almost like we've become prisoners of the past and that they are the ones who will uh, interpret for us the way ahead. Yeah. With great respect to lawyers, I think it's really important that we keep lawyers away from um, these matters um, because lawyers tend to see things in ahistorical terms. What I'd love to see is the development of um, many, many historians, properly trained historians in our society. These are the people we need. We let lawyers be confined to legal the legal profession. In my opinion, since the 1980s, lawyers have taken, a small group of lawyers have taken it upon themselves to move into the political sphere and using a lot of legal jargon have, um, have controlled how we understand these things. And part of it is the ahistorical mindset of lawyers, because of course they use precedent. Um, so lawyers are very concerned about what was said in the past coming through into the present and on into the future. But historians, people who are trained as historians, see history far more in terms of, um, you know, things that happened that were caused by what went on at a particular time and may no longer be relevant. So, yes, I would, um, to all the lawyers listening, I do, I do respect lawyers, but I, I am worried about the influence that lawyers have had on the how the treaty is promoted. Um, I, I very much like your idea that democracy ought to be messy, and 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 I completely agree because I mean that again alludes to the idea that we we almost started with this liberal idea. I, I would contend that ideas should be contested, that you need to kind of battle it out, you know, with words over ideas and. Again, whether it's in history or whether it's in science or whether it's the underpinnings of, of government, which is the, the democratic idea. And in any of those spheres, if you allow a priesthood to, whether it's lawyers or uh, public servants or academics, take over and interpret things for you, then you lose that contestability and you lose liberalism because now you're back with uh sacred claims and and the the priesthood who are the holders of those claims and enforce them on on society at large so i think you know we might we might be coming to the end here but it would be good to talk more explicitly about the threat to democracy that these ideas pose um, can I, I'd like to put forward a not so ridiculous suggestion that in all our ministries and our government departments, I reckon we should have a ratio of two to one when it comes to historians, um, two historians for every lawyer or management type person. That's a good idea. <laughs> Although I'd add we, we should have some scientists too. Because oh, of his, course. His, his Sorry, historians and, and scientists. <laughs> Histori let, or even mathematicians. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind a few method. mathematicians too. They, they, they're yes, pretty versed yes, in thinking yes. logically. So, uh, yeah. I, yeah. What you so, really want, of course, is classicists, but they, you know, they don't come cheap. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ab, yes. Really, it's um, people trained in the disciplines. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? And mm -hmm. if our universities were doing their jobs properly, and, you know, I, I do really feel for the academics who are suffering around the country at the moment with the cuts that are going on. Uh, but it, it's hard for me 
to think that the universities haven't to some extent brought this on themselves, not in a direct sense. And again, I, I'm upset about what's happening uh, at the moment, but it seems to me universities have lost their way uh, and they should be populating our public servants, uh, our pu public service and other institutions with historians and scientists and mathematicians who really understand the basis of their disciplines and bring that to bear when they start to do public administration and 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 other tasks in society. It seems to me that is the fundamental mission of the universities that they have abrogated through uh, episodes like the one that you were involved in uh, uh, over that that listener letter and and you know banning various speakers from campuses and and making pronouncements that are based on more. Uh, kind of sacred claims then on on evidence a lot of the time. Oh, you're, you're a lot kinder to the universities than I am, Michael. I would say they have brought it upon themselves. Um, New Zealand universities have become the laughing stock of the world with this um, indigenization project. I've just had a piece published in University World News where I criticize the way um, all our universities are now doing what they call indigenizing, decolonizing. No, a university is actually called a university because it is universal. Yes. It is dedicated to the to the universal knowledge of humanity. It's not parochial. It's not localized. Now, what? Who are the mathematicians, the scientists, the um, classicists? who will come to our universities when they know that they are required to swear allegiance to the Treaty of Waitangi, to be indigenized. And not only that... The that universities that, that, have lost their way. Not only that, that because of their non-Māori ethnicity, they they won't be able to contest for funding on the same basis and, the, and that their... Uh, their research won't be counted as as heavily in the, in our funding mechanisms. Mm. Yes, in very practical ways, they will realise that they are second class um, academics in our universities. Yes, so I think the universities have a lot to answer for, and um, the vice chancellors need to be held to account for what has gone on. All right. Um, that's great. Great ending. Um, probably is. We're probably going to keep talking about, about this uh, topic ourselves, actually, and keep writing about it. So there'll be more from us on that, too. But but thanks very much, uh, Elizabeth. And sorry about the um, mess up with the tech stuff. But um, it's always great to talk, Elizabeth. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. <laughs>